Okay. Okay. All right. Well, welcome to another exciting uh, live stream here at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, I am Education Specialist Jacob Davis. I'm joined here today with Tracy McIntyre, Director of Communications. Excellent. So today's live stream is going to be all about hygiene, uh, personal hygiene uh, for Civil War soldiers. Uh, and the main source that we're going to be using for a lot of our quotes that are coming out of today is a book that we actually sell here in the bookstore. You can actually uh, buy it online uh, at National Museum of uh, uh, Civil War Medicine's uh, uh, website. Uh, but it is Doctors in Blue by George Worthington Adams. But this had a lot of wonderful quotes and a lot of wonderful sources, uh, specifically talking about personal hygiene of uh, Civil War soldiers. Um, so. It's a wonderful book that basically just gives a, a great overview of the Union side of uh, medicine during the Civil War. Um, so uh, with a lot of our uh, live streams, we usually like to start with some sort of a recipe uh, just to sort of uh, uh, get everyone, whet everyone's appetites, I guess. Uh, and no, so, pun <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> um, so we kind of uh, continued that theme now um, into uh, personal hygiene. And we're going to be making a recipe, uh, which I uh, uh, am volunteering to try, uh, for um, a toothpaste from uh, the Civil War. So this is a recipe that comes to us from the Confederate Receipt Book, and it is for a charcoal tooth powder. Mm -hmm. Receipt books like this um, would be things that would be printed uh, for, obviously, for the um, for distribution, but specifically for Confederate soldiers, obviously geared towards Confederate soldiers, there would be ones for Union soldiers as well uh, to basically um, uh, fill it with uh, recipes, things like that, things that they may need while they're out on the march. Uh, so it's almost like a, a self-help book to kind of keep in their knapsacks and things like that. So again, this is from the Confederate receipt book. It is for charcoal tooth powder. Uh, the description for it goes, uh, pound charcoal as fine as possible in a mortar or grind it in a mill. So here we have our mortar and pestle, and we also have some charcoal here, which has been provided from our friends up at uh, up just north of us here in Frederick, Maryland, at Catoctin Furnace. All so right. it's uh, charcoal from Catoctin Furnace. Shout out to Catoctin Furnace. Absolutely. Um, so uh, pound charcoal as fine as possible in a mortar, or grind it in a mill, then well sift it. I'm not going to be sifting this. Uh, because again, you have to kind of uh, uh, imagine that obviously soldiers in the field, especially Confederates, probably are going to have something on them to sift this. Maybe a sock, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I would want to sift through a sock. But and then um, put it in your mouth. Probably right. not. Right. Uh, and apply a little bit of it to the teeth about twice a week. Uh, it will not only render them beautifully white, but will also make the breath sweet and the gums firm and comfortable. If the charcoal is ground in a mortar, it is convenient to grind it uh, in water to prevent the dust from flying about. Uh, indeed, the powder is more convenient for use when kept in water. So that's how I'm going to be uh, making it here. And apologies if you're about to hear a lot of grinding noises as I make this. Uh, so I'm going to do what the recipe suggests. I have just a little bit of water here. Uh, made sure that I got this water from a clean drinking source, uh, not one that is, uh, you know, potentially infested with no uh, mud puddles. Uh, no, no mud puddles. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> um, so I'm just going to add a little bit of water here to the mortar and pestle. As it says, you just want sort of enough to make a paste, and I do have uh, several pieces of charcoal uh, inside here. Um, so I'm going to sort of grind this off the table down below me, so that way that noise isn't being transferred through our microphone. And while I do this, sort of ground this into a paste, uh, I want to talk about some other toothpastes that uh, are, you know, around at the time of the Civil War. So people have been brushing their teeth, of course, for centuries uh, prior to the Civil War. Uh, brushing your teeth is not something that's new. Of course, people understand, uh, you know, you want to have healthy teeth. That is the way that you're going to be eating your food. So yeah, cleaning your teeth is something that people have done for ever. Um, and by the time of the 19th century, there are a lot of different methods for uh, brushing teeth. So we have a couple, uh, a couple items here that um, you know would have been available. For one, I can show it if sure. you want to keep grinding. Yeah. Tracy's got uh, a a it's in a ceramic dish. 
This is a toothpaste uh, that would have been sold in Victorian England and probably would have likely made it over here to North American markets. And there are also other types of toothpaste that probably would have been made specifically here in the United States. Um, but this one in particular is a cherry toothpaste, a cherry flavored toothpaste. Just like today, how we like having flavors in our toothpaste, uh, it was the same at that time as well. And people would do a lot of different things to make uh, you know, nice flavored toothpaste um, for obviously if they're putting it in their mouth. Uh, they wanna make sure that it tastes good. Uh, another type of toothpaste, which we have a few items here for, uh, was actually originally published in 1779, so actually during the midst of the uh, American Revolution, but it was published in what would have been probably a magazine uh, at the time in London called The Toilet of Flora, a very nice name. <laughs> uh, Let me grab these. <laughs> and then it was published again, uh, and the reason why we have this for the Civil War is that it was published again in the American Scrapbook and Magazine of the United States in 1862. And basically it just says, to clean teeth and gums, take an ounce of myrrh and fine powder. So that's what we have here. We have myrrh, like frankincense and myrrh. So myrrh and fine powder, two spoonfuls of the best white honey. So we just have a modern raw, raw honey here. Honey. Uh, and a little green sage uh, that is in a very fine powder. Uh, mix them well together and wet the teeth and gums with a little every night and morning. Uh, I don't know how well putting sugar on your teeth would work, <laughs> um, but especially in the 18th century, uh, it's, this, it's similar up to the Civil War, but there's this idea, of course, that bad smells, miasmas, uh, cause um, disease. And so kind of the idea, probably the line of thinking with just putting myrrh and sage on your teeth is that by sort of counter uh, acting against the bad smells of bad breath uh, that you are um, basically uh, get chasing off any sort of uh, uh, bad odors from the mouth. All right, so you can see I've kind of got it into a, a fine paste here. Uh, and now for your enjoyment, certainly, <laughs> certainly not mine, uh, I'm going to be uh, brushing my teeth here. And what kind of toothbrush are you using? Uh, we are using uh, a toothbrush that would have been available uh, during the time of the American Civil War. And were these issued out or were supposed to be issued out? Or is this something that probably soldiers would have... I think they probably would have bought their own from, okay. a, from a sutler um, or brought from, brought from home. But mm -hmm. it's usually... Um, Pretty rough bristles. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's very rough bristles, and it's probably made from uh, would have been made historically from I imagine bone. Bone uh, handle. Yeah, right. bone handle toothbrush. Uh, so I'm gonna get just a little bit of the paste here uh, on my teeth, and uh, again, this is for your enjoyment and not mine. Uh, so here we go. How's it taste? It tastes about as bad as you can imagine. It tastes, charcoal. tastes like charcoal. <laughs> now, I'm not going to brush with a dentist recommended uh, two minutes. No. I think I'm going to cut it a little short. Um, so let me go ahead and rinse and spit. Uh, how does it look? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so much for bright white teeth. Excuse me while I spit off screen. Oh, uh, actually, you're on screen. Oh, good. You know? Good. Hmm. <laughs> that's that's quality content right there. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll smile for the public. I definitely still have some in my teeth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm. There's a little bit of black in there. Mm. Oh well, maybe I'm far enough away from the camera that uh, it won't show up. But while this seems really silly. It actually works. Um, one of the things with brushing your teeth with charcoal, A, people still do it to this day. You can buy toothpaste that have, uh, and don't mind me, I'm just gonna be trying to rinse this out a little bit more as I'm talking, but you can still buy toothpaste to this day that have activated charcoal. A lot of people will use activated charcoal um, to clean their teeth. Mm -hmm. And 
when you're cleaning your teeth, you keep in mind that... Uh, this, yeah, the alternative. The alternative to cleaning your teeth would be, uh, you know, if your teeth ended up being uh, needing uh, dental care. Extraction. Um, extraction, for example. The, uh, the 19th century dentists were, were pretty horrific. Um, although 95% uh, of all the operations during the Civil War were conducted using anesthesia, mm -hmm. dental work, however, was, uh, was not uh, just because of the fact that they had to cover their nose and mouth to apply anesthesia. Though so it should be noted that the first public display of an anesthetic was, was uh, a dentist. A dentist, uh, yes. But, uh, but yeah, but in terms of, of extracting uh, teeth, Extracting though, teeth, they could not anesthetize the patient. So here we have a photograph of a 19th century dentist who is extracting, extracting a tooth teeth. from his patient and his patient is not looking too happy, grabbing the dentist by the hair uh, and just looks generally miserable. Uh, I don't know if a lot of 19th century dentists were bald as a result of this tactic, but, uh, but there you go. That was the alternative. <laughs> Um, I think I'd rather have the charcoal. Yeah, yeah, so would I. Um, so, uh, dis so despite orders uh, for bathing, um, basically any of these orders were uh, would have been neglected by some of the men. Certainly, people did bathe, uh, but probably not as regularly, obviously, um, as as they should have been. Uh, brushing teeth, though, uh, was popular in foreign armies, and it was approved by hygienists as a preventative of agues and disease. Uh, but it was very rare that people were brushing their teeth in the United States or Confederate States military at this time. Um, again, it's just something that uh, uh, people, I guess, just necessarily, that's not the first thing that you're thinking about, especially personal hygiene. And we have a lot of uh, to back this up, that uh, a lot of these soldiers that are signing up, it's important to keep in mind, many of them, uh, the majority of recruits were in their teens and early 20s. Uh, and for a lot of us, uh, many of us who have gone to college and you spend those first few years in the dorm rooms, uh, that's usually sort of the, the joke it, when your parents, your family come to visit, your first time off on your own, that uh, dorms can be uh, maybe pretty comparable to what some of these tents and uh, huts and uh, barracks were described as. Uh, but all their lives, people had cooked, cleaned, washed uh, for these soldiers, and now they needed to perform the tasks for themselves and would uh, do them in their own way, uh, which was likely in, uh, in defiance of, you know, orders, fussy orders uh, that would have been coming from surgeons or officers. Um, so the other thing too is that um, it's also going unchecked. No one is necessarily checking in, and that could be for a number of reasons. It could be ignorance of the officers in checking uh, for, you know, uh, hygiene standards and in, in, in camps and hosp uh, in camps and, uh, um, barracks and things of that nature. But it could also be that uh, certain officers that are seeking, you know, popularity uh, among, uh, uh, you know, their troops aren't going to be the ones to go around and chastise their troops for, um, you know, not taking care of themselves. Um, so the United States uh, Sanitary Commission wrote that it dealt with the rugged individualism of the American people. Uh, on getting to camp, recruits would let themselves go. Men who were so careless that they frequently shot themselves by accident could give little attention to the Sanitary Commission's idea of camp cleanliness or the advice of medical officers. Uh, so here's a remark from one surgeon about the cleanliness of soldiers. It was a common subject of remark, wrote a surgeon, that men who but a few weeks before occupied positions in society demanding cleanliness and care for personal appearance now disregarded it and either from apathy or laziness, neither washed their persons nor their clothing they carried upon them. Uh, it goes on to say that camps were filled with all manner of waste, trash left in tents, men going to the bathroom where they pleased, latrines unused and unattended, animal waste lying everywhere. Uh, there's also descriptions of dead dogs lying around camps, and the list goes on for these heinous, <laughs> Uh, uh, descriptions of what a lot of these camps look like. And it should be noted too that there is distinguishing differences between the camps of regular army troops who had been serving, professional army troops who had been serving prior to the Civil War and into the Civil War, and then volunteer troops as well. Where there are statistics that were done that by and large 
regular camps uh, usually met sort of uh, um, uh, sanitary qualifications uh, that were put down by the United States Sanitary Commission, whereas volunteer camps where, you know, a lot of people are coming out, they're soldiering for the first time, they've just volunteered, they've left their farms, their you know, jobs on the docks, those sorts of things. And usually volunteer camps are uh, um, uh, not so nice. Uh, in terms of cleanliness, um, there were army regulations that came out as early as uh, 1861 uh, for daily washing of hands and face, uh, the washing of feet, <laughs> at least uh, at least twice a month to wash oh, your oh. feet, uh, so at least twice a month, <laughs> and a complete bath once or twice a month. Because of cold water and the lack of facilities and opportunity, men often went months without bathing or washing their clothes. Of course, we know today, uh, and they hopefully knew then, but it seemed, again, it seems like they disreg uh, disregarded anything, but when you wash your clothes regularly and wash your person regularly, it helps cut down on uh, illness, uh, you know, things like funguses, uh, things like insects as well. And Tracy has got uh, a couple wonderful quotes here uh, to talk about uh, uh, some friends that soldiers made along the way. The Tracy, soldier's friends, the indeed. Soldier's friends, exactly. The soldier's tiny little friends. Uh, okay, well, um, there's a, a Wilbur F. Hinman from the 65th Ohio Infantry wrote a book called Corporal Side Clegg and His Pard. Uh, and he talks about, in this book, he talks about um, the soldiers would often grow some of their fingernails to be a little bit longer than normal because they would use them to go skirmishing for graybacks. Uh, graybacks was the term that a lot of uh, soldiers used for lice, and skirmishing would basically be going off and taking off your clothing and looking for lice that were crawling into the seams of your garments. Mm. Once you found a louse, uh, you would take, uh, place one thumbnail on each side of the insect, apply a quick pressure, there would be a snap like the crack of a percussion cap, and the insect would be dead. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that aspect of, of skirmishing. Uh, indeed, uh, the louse was uh, considered to be uh, the most common insect that would infest uh, the, the um, the soldiers. Uh, in uh, Hardtack and Coffee, which is a book by John D. Billings, uh, he served with the 10th Massachusetts Battery during the war. He says, um, the, the woods would usually be found uh, near the camps that they were full of the men sprinkled about singly or in social parties of two or three, <laughs> slaying their victims by the thousands. Oh. So, you know, you could go have a louse squishing party. Oh. Uh, and now and then a man could be seen just from the quartermaster with an entire new suit on his arm, bent on starting afresh. He'd hang the suit on the bush, strip off every piece of his old clothing, and set fire to the same, and don the new suit of blue. Uh, some of the um, some of the men uh, were were not uh, too keen, as as uh, Jacob has said, about changing their changing their clothing. And uh, what they when they did uh, do their laundry, sometimes they would use their mess kettles. Oh, great. To boil their laundry. Hey, it just, it's, it's seasoning the mess kettle it, for, for, the, for the next use when in, it's used as a mess kettle. In, indeed. Yeah. And uh, in, uh, in the uh, Hard Tack and Coffee, uh, John Billings says, uh, while it might at first interfere somewhat with your appetite to have your food cooked in the same vessel that you use for laundry, Ugh. you would soon get used to it. And so this complex use of the mess kettle soon ceased to affect the appetite. So that's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would not want to have soup uh, from there. No, yeah, yeah. I would not have <laughs> want to, yeah, not be having stew from there anytime soon. I do want to talk about, in terms of whenever we talk about the United States Sanitary Commission, um, a little bit about sort of who they were. Basically, it was an organization, the best way I can describe it is almost like, a, a, almost like lobbyists, right? Where they're lobbying Congress, uh, they're trying to get uh, legislation passed to basically help the sanitary conditions of, of almost every aspect of military life, ranging from personal hygiene to the uh, you know, hygienic standards of barracks, tents, camps, the hygienic standards, and I think this is probably where they shine the best, of hospitals, 
uh, and caring for the sick and wounded in the most hygienic uh, um, you know, ways possible. But I have here a little bit of information um, and some quotes from Secretary Frederick Law Olmsted, who is basically uh, in charge of, of the United States Sanitary Commission. In early summer 1861, uh, the U.S. Sanitary Commission issued a circular addressed to the colonels of the army. So basically they understood that the best way of trying to disseminate information throughout the entire um, uh, uh, throughout the entire military was at the regimental level, starting at the top, so with your colonels. Uh, it is, uh, this is a quote from Frederick Law Olmsted. It is well known that when a considerable body of men have been living together in a camp a few weeks, a peculiar subtle poison is generated, the effect of which is exhibited in stiffness of muscles, sickness of the stomach in the morning, sudden and unusual looseness of the bowels, and subsequently by dysentery and other endemic and epidemic diseases uh, of a still more fatal character, such as camp fevers and cholera. He remarked that dangers would be averted by strict cleanliness and proper preparation of good food. And again, like I said, this responsibility was put on the officers. So it was the individual officers who were basically supposed to then spread this information again from a top down. So the Colonel Olmsted said, should hold the captains responsible for sanitation and hygiene in their companies. The captains should hold their subalterns responsible and the subalterns should see that the non-commissioned officers made their squads keep clean. Uh, that's all well and good. That's all <laughs> wonderful and, and it's a great sentiment. Um, but what the reality actually sort of uh, how it bears out, uh, of course, is that, you know, a lot of times, especially sanitation, these sorts of things are going uh, un unheard, un unnoticed. Right. And especially the I mean, even the officers would get infected mm -hmm. um, and uh, eventually it became sort of so common that, that every soldier was infected that um, I have a quote here, it says, uh, so universal were the lice at that time, none thought of being ashamed of them. And we've even heard the boys declare they knew all the bugle calls, had become so expert in drill as to go through the battalion movement quite accurately and to have their regular guard mountings and dress parades. <laughs> I can't imagine a lice dress parade. <laughs> and one of the soldiers says that um, he pulled off a shirt last night and threw it down. This morning I saw it moving first one way and then another. I thought at first that there was a rat under it, but upon inspection I found it was the lice racing about hunting for a soldier. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And then I see too you have a, uh, uh, a prayer. They have a soldier's prayer okay. uh, for, uh, for lice. Uh, he's, it, it is, uh, now I lay me down to sleep while graybacks o'er my body creep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord their jaws to break. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, it's just sort of uh, also this idea of trying to get the humor, I guess, out of very unfortunate situations. Civil um, War soldiers were very good at that. Yeah, and that's definitely <laughs> something that uh, I think that we, you know, it's one of those mentalities that I think we still hold, obviously, with soldiers today of just like when you're in these situations, basically just trying to uh, make anything uh, uh, entertaining or, or trying to just keep your mind off of uh, the rigors of, of what your regular, you know, work in, 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 you know, implies and implores, um, which I think kind of brings up another point is that when you think about the fact that so many of these people are not concerned about hygiene or just, you know, have a wanton disregard for their personal hygiene, uh, it's, po you know, it's possible that a lot of that could stem from if you're having to march for miles, do these duties, uh, haul artillery around, um, you know, stand guard, all these sorts of things, that it probably comes down to, well, I'm not going to take the extra few minutes to take my clothes down to the laundress and, and have them washed, or mm -hmm. I'm not going to take those extra few minutes to clean my teeth or worry about my personal hygiene when all I want to do uh, between my tasks and my duties as a soldier is is sleep uh, or just relax or, or you know share some camaraderie with, with my fellow soldiers uh, which I definitely think you know helps paint a picture of, of sort of where a lot of these soldiers priorities lie and obviously it's not in uh, personal hygiene right yeah. and, and they would often joke about you know sometimes that uh, how dirty somebody could get mm -hmm. And uh, there was a story, uh, John Billings relates a story of a man who was so negligent in cleanliness that when he finally took a bath, 
He found a number of shirts and socks which he supposed he had lost. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So, um, and being as the title of this uh, this live stream is toothpaste and ticks, mm -hmm. I did want to mention that the ticks were also an issue yes. uh, for soldiers on the march, mm -hmm. uh, and they they were would call them wood ticks, uh, and they would uh, when they were. Um, getting ready for bed, sometimes they would feel a lump on their body mm -hmm. and they would realize that, oh, that's probably a tick. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, treating it goes, uh, Wilbur Hinman, uh, who wrote uh, Corporal Cy Clegg in his part, says, if the tick had only his head under the skin, it was not a difficult matter to remove it. A grasp with thumb and forefinger and a quick jerk would separate the blood distended body from the head, leaving the latter to be removed by a little heroic treatment with a jackknife. The wood tick never let go. He could only be disposed of by pulling him in two and getting rid of him in sections. Occasionally one burrowed so far that the knife of the surgeon was found necessary. Mm. Obviously with tick bites back then, they didn't have to deal with the Lyme disease factor. Sure. Um, but still, they they knew that it was not, not healthy to keep one on you. <laughs> uh, and, and I think too that it's like, it's just a, I, a nature of any blood sucking insect. I mean, it's the same with like the spread of malaria, mm -hmm. that there are certain bloodborne illnesses that even ticks back then uh, would have likely had, uh, right. you know, spreading from one person to another. Of course, these are all things though that a, a soldier at the time would not have uh, understood or, or, you know, captured. Obviously today we're always checking ourselves for ticks because we know the dangers that, that ticks possess. But yeah, back then, the, the main danger was just that you had this thing that was burrowed in your flesh. It was hanging on you, right. on your flesh and sapping you of your blood. Right. <laughs> um, so I think at this time, uh, we're going to go ahead and open it up to any questions that we may have received throughout uh, uh, the live stream today. And also to any questions that you might have, uh, you know, right now. Um, so uh, we have our moderator. Uh, Mr. Mike Marr, have we uh, received any any comments, any questions throughout the? Uh, yes. Throughout the great. Yes, awesome. We love that. Uh, we do have one question uh, from loyaltyofdogs.com. Did officers require tobacco chewers to use spittoons in camp? Um, that's a good question. Uh, there are actually, uh, and they talk about it, and again, Doctors in Blue, which you can purchase on our store, at uh, on our website. Uh, but they talk about in Doctors in Blue where uh, officers are actually advocating for their men to be issued tobacco as a ration. Um, there's not really much that's talked about in the way of them spitting. However, there is a lot talked about in the way of where people go to the bathroom. So <laughs> I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste. Oh, that's not, maybe that's no, not. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea about uh, where soldiers are going to the bathroom. There are several descriptions by um, these uh, officers of the United States Sanitary Commission that are going around, these commissioners that are going around. And each camp is supposed to have what are referred to as sinks. Um, basically, those sinks are trenches that are dug in the ground that soldiers would be going to, or were supposed to go to the bathroom in. Then you would take a little bit of dirt every single day and you're supposed to cover over um, the, the, you know, the refuse, the human refuse. However, a lot of these commissioners from the United States Sanitary Commission um, often write about the fact that soldiers are oftentimes going to the bathroom wherever they please. Um, soldiers oftentimes are not using the sinks that are readily available to them and will oftentimes maybe walk as little as 20 feet away from their tents to go to the bathroom. That's both standing up and sitting down. Um, one, two. Right. Uh, <laughs> and so if that shows you sort of the carelessness of of you know, bodily functions, but also of uh, getting rid of fluids from the human body. Um, yeah, in terms of where these soldiers are spitting, um, they're, they're spitting everywhere. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, so yeah, probably not having you know regimental spittoons uh, sitting around <laughs> for the soldiers to come uh, come and use. I would doubt it, and and that actually triggered a, a memory that I have of of going through uh, one of my ancestors. Uh, um, records, my ancestors' records in the um, in the archives. He was with the 30th Maine, and he was down at the Battle of Port Hudson, mm -hmm. and he was in. They had built some earthworks, and uh, the uh, commanding officer had to issue a um, uh, an order of the day 
that said uh, soldiers caught urinating on the earthworks <laughs> will be severely disciplined. Oh, man. So there you are. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I guess it does add a certain obstacle uh, if the earthworks are trying to be uh, overtaken by an opposing Well, force. true. <laughs> ke chemical warfare. Oh, right. You're right. <laughs> right. Uh, Mike, anything else coming through? Yes. Uh, what do they wipe with? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say leaves. Yeah, so uh, leaves, whatever's readily available. Um, paper. Pa uh, paper, news yeah, news, newspapers. Used newspapers. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, are things that they're going to be wiping with. Um, but, yeah, obviously not Charmin Ultra. Not, mm -hmm. you know, there's yeah. not toilet paper that's being issued to the individual soldiers. Um, so, and a lot of times you read descriptions of soldiers usually seeing themselves off into the woods uh, to use the restroom. And part of that might stem from the fact too that we're talking about the Victorian era. And so there's these whole ideas about personal privacy and everything like that. So good heavens, you're not gonna wanna go to the bathroom in front of a bunch of different soldiers. So you'll see yourself off to the woods. And obviously if you're seeing yourself off to the woods, uh, leaves uh, will be in abundance. Hopefully they knew uh, the difference between you know poison ivy and uh, yeah poison ivy would be bad <laughs> right um but yeah mostly just using essentially whatever is, is available to them and that also uh can sort of explain away as well in terms of you know sanitation uh, of course people uh, are not appropriately um sanitizing themselves uh so what that means is you know people are simply using just simple leaves to try and clean themselves and they're not washing their hands on that regular basis like they're supposed to be doing. You can also imagine, you know, the type of filth that is going to be on people's hands, especially as they're trying to share rations with their fellow soldiers and everything else. And, and or the, even the company cooks. Or even the company cooks um, as well. You know, coming back after using the their restroom in the woods mm -hmm. and uh, proceeding to make bread right. or whatever. Yeah. And I think probably too the main reason why when they talk about cleanliness that they specifically mention daily washing of the hands and face is think about what a soldier's uniform looks like. That uniform is basically gonna cover everything all the way up to the neck, all the way down to the wrist. And so therefore the only things that are going to be technically getting physically dirty would be the hands and the face, which is why that is what you're supposed to be washing on a daily basis. Again, not necessarily concerned with the funguses and everything else that's growing on people's bodies from wearing sweaty, unwashed shirts regularly um, but you know again uh, uh, just worried about the presenting thing so the hands and and the face that the the soldiers will be uh, you know actually showing and we do have a uh, we do have a blog on our website called how parasites change the American Civil mm -hmm. War mm -hmm. uh, and in that blog it says the heavy layered wool clothing that the that uh, the soldiers were wearing provided the perfect temperature and environment for body lice to thrive and a sergeant from an Iowa unit reported, I have seen many men literally wear out their underclothes without a change, and when they threw them off, they swarm with vermin like a live anthill when disturbed. Oh, oh. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a good mental image right there. Uh, Mike, anything else coming through for us? Uh, nothing else has come through yet. All right, well then at this time, I wanna thank all of you who tuned in today for our live stream, for tuning in. Uh, by all means, down in the comment section, please let us know what topics you might be interested in us talking about uh, further in the future. Uh, if you, right off the top of your head, have any um, recipes, uh, that mm -hmm. specifically recipes, I will say, that have a connection to Civil War medicine, um, maybe that, you know, family recipes, those sorts of things that have been passed down, uh, share those in the comment section, but again, uh, specifically if they pertain to Civil War medicine. Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, we'll, we'll try out your, your medicinal recipe uh, sometime in the future. Maybe I'll get Tracy to, to try the... Uh... Yeah, I, I, <laughs> since I didn't brush my teeth right, with charcoal, right. I guess I'm, so, I'm so make, next on yeah, the list. Make for, sure it's something that's yeah. nice and sweet and everything else. Yeah, please. Else. And, yeah. You know, smells right, nice, right. tastes good, whatever. Yeah. But again, we want to thank you all for tuning in today here at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Of course, uh, you can come visit us anytime you want. Monday, or I guess seven days a week now. Seven days a week. Uh, Monday to Saturday, we're open 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Sunday, 5 p.m., sorry, sorry. Uh, and uh, uh, Sundays, it's 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., yep. Oh, downtown Frederick, Maryland. Yep, downtown Frederick, Maryland. 
Uh, so again, thank you all for tuning in and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.